Hello friends, welcome back. If you remember, in the last class, we started discussing about the rheological properties of bitumen. Under the rheological properties, we started our discussion by understanding the response of a typical viscoelastic material. We discussed that the viscoelastic response of bitumen can be typically measured using auxiliary testing using a dynamic shear ohmmeter and we also discussed that the advantage of auxiliary testing is that we can measure the response in a shorter period of time and under a range of temperature and loading conditions. Then we discussed about some of the uh, typical parameters which are used to quantify the responses of a uh, viscoelastic material such as bitumen. We discussed about the term delta if you remember which was denoted as phase lag and we understood this term in reference to the response of a purely elastic material where we discussed that the value of delta will be equal to 0. We further discussed and in fact we derived that how the value of delta will be equal to 90 degree in case of a purely viscous response and for a typical viscoelastic material the value of phase lag will range somewhere between 0 and 90 degrees. We further discussed about other parameters such as complex shear modulus. We discussed about the components of the complex shear modulus which are the storage modulus D G prime and the viscous modulus or the loss modulus that is G double prime. We also discussed about the value of 10 delta which is the damping parameter for a viscoelastic material. In this particular slide where we were talking about the linear viscoelastic regime and as I mentioned typically while testing bitumen using a dynamic shear ohmmeter, we use low strain amplitudes and we ensure that the measurements which we are doing are well within the linear viscoelastic regime because various assumptions for example application of time temperature superposition principle and other related theories are applicable only for uh, linear viscoelastic materials. And how did we define the linear viscoelastic regime? We discussed that this can be defined as the point where the value of complex modulus or G star drops to 95 percent of its initial value and this is an assumption or you can say consideration to define the uh, linear viscoelastic regime. Typically we can carry out an amplitude sweep test or a strain sweep test in the laboratory or a stress sweep test if you are interested in the linear viscoelastic stress value and we can see that how the value of G star changes with increase in the amplitude and accordingly we can calculate the uh, linear viscoelastic limit. The strategic highway research program has done a lot of testings on unmodified bitumen and they have related the linear viscoelastic strain limit and stress limit with the stiffness of the binder. And just to repeat that this stiffness parameter or this equations which we discussed are applicable only when the test is done at a fixed frequency of 10 radians per second or 1.59 hertz. So, let us now proceed from here and discuss about some of the rheological tests which we carry out typically for characterization of the bitumen properties. First of all, we have to understand that how the geometric configuration in the DSR are usually taken. So, in the DSR, we basically have a base plate alright and then we have a spindle on it which you can see here. So, this is the base plate and this is the spindle and between the base plate and the spindle we will sandwich a small bitumen sample which you can see here. Now, this bitumen sample has some height, it has some dia or some radius. So, the selection of the dia of the spindle or the bitumen sample and the height of the bitumen sample, it is very critical while doing experiments in the rheometer. We will discuss what typical values are usually taken, but before that let us try to understand that what the DSR actually does. So, the DSR 
basically can measure or can apply torque to the sample and it can monitor the amount of movement which it is undergoing. So, with respect to these two parameters, other parameters are calculated. So, these parameters which we discussed in the last class that is the complex shear modulus, loss modulus, storage modulus and so on all are derived parameters, but typically the DSR can only apply a given torque and it can monitor the amount of movement which it undergoes when the spindle is oscillating or rotating uh, over the sample. How is the calculation of stress done? So, let us first try to understand it with respect to torque. So, how do we define torque? Torque is basically the force applied into the distance. So, here uh, if you see that the distance uh, which uh, is applying is equal to the radius. So, it is r all right. So, force in terms of stress uh, can be written as uh, stress into the area. Now, here area is actually the movement and if, if you see and if you remember our discussion in the uh, last presentation that the uh, spindle actually moves only half of the entire circular area all right. So, if you uh, remember we discussed about the point A, B and C. So, you can try to imagine that it moves only half of the area. So, this is pi r square by 2 all right into r. So, from here we can calculate stress as 2 t by pi r cube. All right. So, stress is basically a function of the torque which we are applying and the radius of the spindle or the radius of the sample here. So, this is written here. Now, let us talk about strain. Okay. So, to understand strain let us see at this picture. So, this is an enlarged picture of the sample and how the torque is being applied to that particular thickness. So, let us say that the thickness of the sample is h. Okay. So, uh, if this is the sample and it is undergoing some deformation. Let us say this is uh, delta L, okay. this is H. All right. So, you can see here that this particular uh, deformation, this can be written as what r theta. So, this delta L can be written as r theta. Okay. So, this is theta. So, the strain will be delta L by H. So, this is r theta by h. So, this is how strain is calculated using the value of theta which is the rotational angle here and the radius of the specimen and the height of the specimen. All right. And using this value of stress and strain, uh, since we are representing stress as sigma, so let us, we, so that we avoid confusion, say this is just equal to sigma. You can see that how the stress and strain is calculated using the value of torque and value of theta and the geometrical parameters and all the other values or parameters are basically derived from these parameters or these values of stress and strain. And for linear viscoelastic material, the stress will be proportional to strain and the proportionally constant can be represented as G star written as G here. So, this is basically the complex shear modulus which we are defining as the linear viscoelastic modulus of the specimen. Talking about the selection of talking about the selection of the sample size in terms of radius or diameter and height, we have to understand these equations and then what are the criteria which are imposed during the measurement. We have to understand that DSR being a mechanical instrument has its own limitations in terms of upper and lower torque. So, it has its own capacity of applying some minimum torque, it has its own capacity of applying a maximum torque. So, depend that depends from machine to machine, that depends from manufacturers to manufacturers. All right. When we are trying to do the test, let us say the bitumen sample at a low temperature and high frequency. So, what do we understand by now that at low temperature and at higher frequency the binder is very stiff all, all right. Now, since it is very stiff the linear viscoelastic strain will also be very low. Since the binder is stiff we actually have to apply more torque to induce the shear. So, I want a higher shear in the material, but my DSR which I am using can have its maximum torque limitation. So, this is now 
redundant for us. Okay, so, this is a constraint that I cannot go beyond a particular value of torque. So, in order to achieve higher stress at lower temperature and high frequency, what I can do? I can reduce the value of radius of the specimen, so that the stress can be increased. Now, since the linear viscoelastic strain required is low here, if we are trying to see in terms of linear viscoelastic strain, so for producing a lower strain, I can increase the value of h for a fixed value of theta. So, what does it mean that at lower temperatures and at higher frequency, we need a geometry such that the radius of the specimen is low and the height of the specimen is more. Now, let us talk about the other end where we are trying to measure the response of the binder at higher temperature and lower frequency. So, here we need to in induce low stress because the binder is more viscous in nature. All right. So, now DSR has a limitation of applying some minimum torque. So, again the torque becomes fixed that at least a minimum torque needs to be applied. So, if we want to achieve lower stress value at a fixed value of torque, what we can do? we can increase the radius of the specimen or we can increase the dia of the specimen. Similarly, if we want to achieve higher LV strain here for a fixed value of theta, then again we can reduce the value of H. So, which means at higher temperature and lower frequency, the geometry of the specimen should be such that the gap is less and the radius is more. All right. So, based on subsequent studies, many studies on the binder, this is what is typically proposed when we are doing a testing with a dynamic shear in the laboratory. So, when we are doing the test, let us say from 0 to 40 degree Celsius, now that also depends on the stiffness of the binder. So, say the stiffness of the binder ranges from 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power 7 Pascals. In that case, it is recommended that we use a 8 mm spindle with 2 mm gap. All right. And if the temperature is higher than 40 degree Celsius, binder becoming more viscous in nature. So, at greater than 40 degree Celsius or in terms of stiffness, if we say when the stiffness is somewhere between um, 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 5 Pascals, then a 25 mm spindle is recommended with 1 mm gap. Typically, the spindle of 40 mm is not used because most of the times we may not be as in reference to various specifications which we use to do the testing. Uh, we do not typically do the testing at greater than let us say 80 to 90 degrees Celsius. All right. So, in that case 40 mm spindle is not of much interest for usual or general testing on bitumen. With this now let us move forward and talk about some of the common tests which can be done or which are usually done on bitumen to understand the viscoelastic response and also various variations which are which are uh, drawn to understand the behavior of the bitumen. Of course, DSR being a very robust machine, you can do a lot of rheological test, you can study various rheological aspects of bitumen and not only bitumen, any polymeric or fluid system. So, you can do a lot of test in various modes, all right. But typically uh, for bitumen, we are interested to see what happens when it is subjected to auxiliary loads and that is what we are going to talk about. Common type of test which is used during the study of bitumen, it includes strain sweep or amplitude sweep test. So, what is a strain sweep, sweep or amplitude sweep test? Here we are trying to see the variation of any viscoelastic parameter, let us say complex modulus, which change in uh, strain level or stress level. Why do we need to do this test? Maybe to identify the LV limit. So, that is one such parameter which can be assessed using a strain sweep test. We typically also do frequency sweep tests very commonly. Now, what is a frequency sweep test or you can say a time sweep test is that we are trying to see the variation of any viscoelastic parameter such as complex modulus which change in frequency okay and why and what what are the benefits of doing a frequency sweep test well you can first of all see that how uh, the binder is responding 
with variation in rate of loading or with variation in frequency of loading. And if we have data for different temperatures, we can plot master curves. As we discussed that DSR also has limitations that we cannot go beyond a given frequency range. So, if you are interested to see the response or identify the response of the binder at much wider range of frequency, we can use master curve where we can uh, shift the response at one temperature to any given reference temperature. All right. Further, we can also plot diagrams such as black diagrams, coal coal diagrams and so on. And we will be discussing what these diagrams are and what are the importance of these diagrams with respect to the study of bitumen. People also carry out temperature sweep test. So, temperature sweep test can be done to assess the temperature susceptibility. If you remember, we have already discussed that what is temperature susceptibility that the we are seeing the variation of the stiffness of bitumen or any uh, consistency property or rheological property of bitumen with change in temperature. Now, rheological parameter being more accurate or a more fundamental measurement of behavior in, in contrast to the physical properties which are more empirical in nature. So, looking at the change in the rheological parameter with change in temperature, we can also measure the temperature susceptibility. And temperature susceptibility again if you remember is directly linked to the performance of the pavement. Let us see some of the common plots which can be made after carrying out these tests. We can make isochronal plots. What are isochronal plots? These are plots where we see the variation of the viscoelastic parameter with change in temperature, but at a fixed frequency. All right. So, you we have to remember that if you are comparing two or three binders using isochronal plots, the plots of all the binders should be at a fixed frequency. Why? Because bitumen being viscoelastic in nature, the response changes with change in frequency. So, we cannot compare isochronal plots for different binders uh, which are made through experiments at different frequency levels. Okay. So, isothermal plots also we can uh, make. So, in isothermal plots we see the variation of the viscoelastic parameter with change in frequency, but again at a fixed temperature. In the isothermal plot, if we have measured the response at different temperatures and if we are interested to see the response at one particular reference temperature, but at a wider range of frequency, we can also plot master curves using the time temperature superposition principle. Black diagrams are something which are not dependent on the frequency and temperature while we are plotting the graph. So, if you have data at different frequency and temperature, we can just directly plot black diagrams which shows the variation of uh, the complex modulus versus phase angle. All right. So, uh, this can also be drawn. We can further plot coal coal diagrams. In coal coal diagrams, we see the variation of G double dash versus G dash, which is the variation or the relationship between the loss modulus and the storage modulus. So, in this particular slide, I am going to show you some of the typical plots which have been taken from uh, several literatures. So, this shows you that how a isochronal plot look like. So, you can see that we have a variation with temperature and on the y axis we have a stiffness parameter. Usually DSR are used to measure the response at intermediate and high temperatures. So, DSR we are not using for measuring the response at let us say negative value of temperature. So, for that we have other form of testing which can be done. We will be discussing about this test when we talk about the super pave uh, binder grading system. So, you can see the top curve here and using this curve uh, you can say uh, locations to see typical behavior. For example, you see they have identified fatigue cracking at the intermediate pavement range. They have identified rutting at the higher um, uh, uh, sorry temperature range. All right. So, this type of curve can be plotted and this uh, is plotted at a fixed frequency or time of 1 second. So, this is a isothermal plot. So, we have some fixed frequencies here and we are trying to see the variation of log stiffness versus logarithmic of time. So, before we see the uh, isothermal plot, let us look at some of the comments related to uh, isochronal plot. As I said, 
that uh, this isochronal plot you can also use to assess the temperature susceptibility. So, here temperature susceptibility can just be represented by the slope of this particular curve. All right. So, if you have multiple bitumens, let us say with multiple form of variations. So, let us say you have a bitumen something like this, something like this, something like this. So, you can understand that how at different temperatures the rate of change of property with with change in temperature occurs and accordingly the selection of appropriate bitumen can be made. Okay. So, uh, well uh, coming to the isothermal plot, so we have some fixed uh, temperature and we are seeing the variation of the um, stiffness parameter or, or the viscoelastic parameter which is let us say complex modulus with increase in loading time. All right. And if we are interested to combine this curve and look at the response at a wider range of loading time, we can use the time temperature superposition principle using appropriate shift factors and we can have the uh, master curve here. Similarly, we can also draw the master curve with respect to frequency which is just the uh, inverse of time. And using the master curve in fact, many of the aspects of bitumen uh, or response of the bitumen can be quantified. For example, if you see we have a region here where uh, with further increase in frequency the value of G star attains a plateau. All right. So, this basically is called as the glassy modulus which if you remember I discussed once is approximately equal to 1 giga Pascal for bitumen. The glassy modulus can also be calculated by plotting uh, the variation of complex modulus versus uh, phase angle. All right, so, which is basically the black diagram and using the black diagram also you can uh, find out maybe through extrapolation the modulus at which the phase angle is equal to 0. So, that modulus at which the phase angle is equal to 0 is actually denoted or termed as glassy modulus. We can also using the master curve identify the uh, steady state viscosity which basically is the lower part which is the viscous response. And uh, here the value of delta is equal to 90 degree. So, that particular parameter can also be identified. Then we also have something which is called as crossover frequency. This is an interesting parameter. So, the crossover frequency is defined as the frequency at a given temperature where the value of storage modulus is actually equal to the value of loss modulus, which means that the uh, value of 10 delta is equal to 1. Okay. So, if we want to approximately identify this using the master curve, then the process is that it is a point in the master curve at which the viscous asymptote which you see here all right, uh, crosses the glassy modulus. So, this location will give you the value of frequency at which the value of loss modulus is equal to the value of storage modulus. Further, uh, we also have one more interesting parameter here which is the value of R which is the rheological index. And what is rheological index? Uh, it is it shows the difference between the glassy modulus and the dynamic complex modulus at the crossover frequency. So, at the crossover frequency this difference between glassy and actual this is indicated as a rheological index. So, then we have black diagrams here you can see for different types of bitumen. Usually for a unmodified bitumen you will get a, a smooth curve you can see here the one with blue this is on a penetration grade bitumen. So, you get a smooth curve. So, this is also a uh, you know an identification that this material is thermorheologically simple or, or time temperature superposition principle can be applied on such type of binder. So, black diagram also facilitates us to understand that whether the binder is thermorheologically simple or complex in nature. For polymer modified binder, for binder with high asphaltines, for binder with high waxes, we sometimes get disjointed black diagrams which you can see here and this shows that there is a breakdown of time temperature equivalency in such a cases in such cases all right and a, as i was saying identification of the glassy modulus so you can just extend this 
extrapolate this to find out the glassy modulus. So, this is the modulus at the phase angle of 0. So, this is the cold coal plot, an example of cold coal plot which is between G double prime and G prime and this basically indicates or is a measure of uh, viscoelastic balance of a bit bitumen because this tells us that how the viscous response and the elastic response in that particular bitumen is related to each other, all right, is related to each other. With this now I hope that it is somewhat clear that how different tests can be done on the bitumen and how this test can be used to plot several variations which can be further used to quantify the viscoelastic properties of the bitumen sample. Now, ultimately what we want to do is we want to relate the rheological properties with the performance because this is the uh, main idea behind doing any type of experimentation. So, I am trying to explore certain properties such that these properties can be correlated or can be related to the occurrence of failure in the field. So, that when I get a chance to select material based on these parameters, I can take the or I can do appropriate uh, um, or I can choose the appropriate bitumen or any material. As I said that DSR is typically used to cover a range of temperature which is between the intermediate in service temperature range to high in service temperature range. So, what are the distresses we are targeting for? So, at the intermediate um, in service temperature usually the distress which uh, occurs is fatigue cracking. So, the responses at the intermediate temperature I will correlate with the susceptibility of the bitumen to fatigue cracking. On the other hand, at high in service temperature, let us say 60 degree Celsius, 70 degree Celsius, where my bitumen becomes soft, rutting or permanent deformation is the more likely form of distress which will occur. Therefore, the responses on bitumen through rheological test which I will be measuring at such high temperatures should be correlated to the occurrence of rutting in the bituminous mixture in the field conditions. Okay. So, in, in this direction some of the parameters have been researched and they are very popularly used. We also have specifications to uh, which uses or put, puts a check to this parameter to select a bitumen such that they can, they can have resistance towards permanent deformation or rutting as well as fatigue cracking. So, some of the parameters for example, for rutting are G star by sin delta we will discuss about this. So, G star by sin delta is a parameter which was initially developed uh, while the super pave uh, performance grade specification was being developed uh, through the SHRP program and they found that G star by if they can put a check to the value of G star by sin delta they can control the occurrence of rutting in the field all right. So, G star by sin delta is a parameter which is correlated with the occurrence of rutting and we will see why G star by sin delta was taken. Before we move forward, let us have a look that why G star by sin delta was actually taken. So, we can look at it from two different perspectives. The first perspective is in reference to the amount of energy dissipated by the binder in one cycle of the rheological test or the auxiliary test. Let us say we are giving an input strain to the material where E is equal to epsilon naught sin omega t and the response of the binder is equal to sigma naught sin omega t plus delta. So, we are trying to look here at the uh, energy per unit volume and this can be written as sigma d e. I hope that you understand why this can be written as sigma d e because you see sigma d e is nothing but force upon area into change in length by original length. So, here in the numerator you see this is energy, here this is volume. So, this is energy per unit volume and since this is a auxiliary test. So, we have omega is equal to 2 pi f. So, omega is equal to 2 pi by t. So, the 
value of t varies from initial point that is 0 to 2 pi by omega all right. So, this is from 0 to 2 pi by omega. Okay. So, if we start to put the actual values here and try to uh, do this uh, derivation which I prefer to do it in a separate slide here. So, let us say that we are looking at total energy per unit volume this is sigma d e all right. So, this I can also write as um, sigma d e by d t into d t all right. So, sigma is sigma naught sin omega t plus delta d e by d t. So, e was actually e naught sin omega t. So, d e by d t becomes equal to e naught omega cos omega t. So, this becomes equal to epsilon naught omega cos omega t d t all right. So, here we can separate this sigma naught epsilon naught omega then we have we can open this term. So, we have sin omega t cos delta plus cos omega t sin delta into cos omega t d t all right. So, again we can now separate this we can write that this is equal to sigma naught epsilon naught omega integration of sin omega t uh, cos delta cos omega t this multiplied with this plus sigma naught epsilon naught e naught omega we have cos square omega t sin delta d t ok. So, this now becomes equal to omega I can take cos delta outside here. So, this becomes equal to sin omega t cos omega t. Uh, this also we can bring sin delta outside here. So, this becomes equal to cos square omega t d t. Okay. So, just few basic of trigonometric functions like we have sin theta into cos theta is equal to sin 2 theta by 2. So, this is one which we can use here. And if you remember again that cos 2 theta is nothing but cos square theta minus sin square theta. So, this can be written as cos square theta minus 1 minus cos square theta all right. So, from here cos square theta can be written as 1 plus cos 2 theta by 2. So, we will use this 2 and we will put it here all right we will put it here. So, from here you can write that this is equal to sigma naught epsilon naught omega cos delta integration of sin 2 omega t by 2 0 to 2 pi by omega plus sigma naught epsilon naught omega sin delta. So, this is equal to 1 plus cos 2 omega t divided by 2 inside right. So, this is also 0 to 2 pi by omega all right. So, this is now just simple integration epsilon naught omega cos delta by 2. So, sin 2 omega t we have. So, this is minus cos 2 omega t by 2 0 to 2 pi by omega and this is sigma naught epsilon naught omega sin delta by 2. So, this can be done by part. So, we have half of t 0 to 2 pi by omega plus sin 2 omega t by 2 the integration of cos 2 omega t here all right from 0 to 2 pi by omega ok. So, if you see here ok. So, if you see just this term. So, if I will put the integral terms here. So, what will I get? It will be minus cos 2 pi minus cos 0 is 1 is not it minus of minus 1. So, cos 2 pi is nothing but 
minus 1, so minus 1 plus 1. So, this entire terms become equal to 0. Similarly, if you see here, we will get how much? Sin 4 pi, if you put 2 pi by omega with t minus 0. So, this is actually 0, so 0 minus 0 is 0. So, this entire terms becomes 0. Therefore, finally, what we have here is that total energy or dissipated energy per unit volume is equal to sigma naught epsilon naught omega. So, we only have you see this term along with this term, everything else is 0, all right. So, omega sin delta divided by this 2 and this 2. So, 4 into if I put the limits here, then you get 2 pi by omega minus 0. Okay. So, this becomes equal to sigma naught epsilon naught into pi. All right. So, I think I have taken 2, 2 times here and I should not have done that. So, I think I have taken 2, 2 times here because I moved it outside and again I have put. So, this 2 should not be there. So, this is 2 actually. So, now it becomes sigma naught E naught pi sin delta, all right. So, this is our final expression, okay. So, uh, this is actually equal to the total dissipated energy in one cycle. Now, you see rutting which we are talking about, it is a stress control phenomena, all right. So, rutting is a stress control phenomena. Therefore, pi sigma naught epsilon naught can be written as sigma naught by g star into sin delta here. So, this becomes equal to pi sigma naught square which is constant divided by g star by sin delta. So, with respect to dissipated energy, we, we should understand that lower is the dissipated energy, more will be the resistance to the deformation. So, here the resistance which we are talking about is permanent deformation, which means lower will be the value of dissipated energy, more will be the resistance uh, to rutting, therefore higher should be the value of G star by sin delta. And that is the reason why G star by sin delta is a representation of the rutting performance of the bitumen. With respect to cracking, if I would like to see, let us say this is the total dissipated energy. So, now cracking or fatigue cracking a strain control phenomena, all right. Therefore, the value of dissipated energy in terms of strain can be written as pi sigma naught can now be written as g star into epsilon naught into epsilon naught we have into sin delta. So, therefore, the dissipated energy becomes equal to pi epsilon naught square g star into sin delta. Again here what we want, we want lower dissipated energy so that the deformation is minimum. And if I want lower dissipated energy, other things being constant g star dot sin delta should be as low as possible. So, lower is the value of g star by sin delta, higher will be the resistance to fatigue cracking. Now, in today's presentation, we are not talking about the limits which were set by SHRP that we will discuss when we discuss about the grading of binders. But in this presentation, it is to know that how g star by sin delta and g star dot sin delta have been used as parameters to quantify uh, permanent deformation characteristics and fatigue cracking of the bitumen respectively. Another way, because in SHRP uh, in many documents, if you see that they mentioned that they considered uh, the inverse of loss compliance. So, J is the compliance, we have already discussed about compliance, this is a ratio of strain to stress. So, this we discussed when we discussed about uh, the uh, various constitutive equation of different models or elements using spring and dash pot. So, uh, they used 1, j, 1 divided by J double prime as the parameter of for rutting and 1 by J double prime is actually equal to G star by sin delta with respect to rutting, all right, with respect to rutting. One thing which maybe I missed in my previous presentations 
was that when we are talking about viscoelasticity, you cannot just compare the compliance with the relaxation modulus, which means you cannot write directly that let us say g star is equal to 1 by j star. Well, this is this is wrong and therefore, we have to understand that since this is a viscoelastic material and there are a lot of re delayed elastic response, retarded responses, they cannot be equated with each other because they are altogether different forms of testing modes. I will try to give you an insight into how j double prime uh, becomes equal to g star by sin delta and it is simple because this is something which we have already discussed. Let us say I want to find j star. So, j star is actually equal to e star by sigma star. Since we have been discussing about control strain testing, so let us say I am giving epsilon naught sin omega t. So, this is divided by sigma naught sin omega t plus delta. So, if I just open it, I get epsilon naught sin omega t divided by sigma naught sin omega t cos delta plus sigma naught cos omega t sin delta all right. So, just I am just taking this in the denominator. So, I get 1 divided by sigma naught by epsilon naught cos delta plus sigma naught by epsilon naught cos omega t divided by sin omega t into sin delta. So, this being the imaginary term. So, I can write this as and this if you remember is nothing but g prime or the storage modulus. So, this is 1 plus g prime plus i g double prime all right. If in the numerator and denominator I just multiply and divide by g prime minus i g double prime. So, I will get g prime minus i g double prime is equal to uh, g prime square minus i g double prime whole square where i is nothing but equal to under root of minus 1. So, this becomes equal to g prime minus i g double prime divided by g prime square plus g double prime square all right. So, j star can now be divided into the real part and the imaginary part just like we did for complex modulus g dash plus i j double dash. So, this becomes equal to g prime divided by g prime square plus g double prime square minus i g double prime divided by g prime square plus g double prime whole square all right all right so j double prime is actually equal to g double prime divided by g dash square plus g double dash square this can written as because g double prime is uh, g star sin delta we know that and this is nothing but mod of g whole square okay because mod of g is under root of g prime square plus g double prime square all right. If I want to take 1 by j double prime, which is represented as the rutting resistance parameter, uh, I get g star by sin delta. So, you see I want here lower value of j double prime, because that represents the viscous response, which I want to reduce. So, if I want to reduce the viscous response, which means I will have to increase the value of g star by sin delta. So, higher is the value of g star by sin delta more is the resistance to rutting. Uh, so, I hope with this it is clear that how these two terms actually came in g star by sin delta and g star dot sin delta. Now, coming to the rutting parameter g star by sin delta when it was developed, it was mostly uh, developed through studies on unmodified bitumen and it did not ensure that when the load is applied to the specimen and when the load is removed how well the sample can recover because this is what happens in a typical pavement right. So, if you consider one point in the pavement the wheel will come here it will go. So, this point is stressed for a particular time and then there is a rest period. So, if during the rest period my binder is capable of recovering completely even though the initial deformation be higher then the rutting resistance will be lower because the accumulation of the permanent tensile strain will be lower here. Therefore, 
various studies on different binders were carried out later and it was found that G star by sin delta does not provide good correlation with the actual rut depth measured especially for those sections where polymer modified binders were being used. All right. So, then researchers started looking for other parameters. In fact, various other parameters were derived or were proposed. For example, we have a parameter like zero shear viscosity and we have several other such parameters. So, one such parameter which is more popularly used now and we have specifications based on this parameter. In fact, in India also presently the polymer modified bitumen specifications which we have that is IS 15462-2019, it uses the unrecoverable creep compliance JNR as the parameter to control the rutting resistance of the uh, bitumen. So, this unrecoverable creep compliance we are not going to discuss in much detail here, uh, but just to give you an idea is evaluated using a multiple stress creep and recovery experiment. All right. So, we carry out a creep and recovery experiment and what we expect that during the creep period if we are seeing the variation of strain uh, with time, then suppose you give a stress and you unload it. So, this stress there are two uh, standard stresses which are given it is 0.1 kilo Pascals and then 3.2 kilo Pascals, but let us say we are giving any magnitude of stress. Let us try to understand it fundamentally rather than uh, in reference to the provision or the codal specification. So, when you stress the material the strain will increase, there will be some elastic response and then the strain will increase and then as you unload it and this response we have previously seen that there will be a recovery. Let us say if we allow the binder to recover and uh, let us say that this is the recovery which we achieve. So, this is basically the recoverable strain and this is the unrecoverable strain. So, the idea is lower is the value of unrecoverable strain better will be the resistance to rutting is not it. So, lower value of unrecoverable strain will ensure that more recovery has happened, the binder has come to its initial position. So, this JNR or the unrecoverable creep compliance is defined as the ratio of unrecoverable strain to the input stress. Okay. So, here we desire that the JNR should be as low as possible to ensure higher resistance to rutting. Another parameter to quantify the amount of recovery is calculated as percent recovery and this is uh, the amount of recovery. So, this is uh, ER or the recovered strain divided by the total strain into 100. So, these two parameters along with because in the in the typical test which we do, we do the test at two different stress levels and therefore, we also measure the stress susceptibility. Ideally, the value of GNR and percent recovery are used to compare different bitumen, especially polymer modified bitumen to quantify the resistance to permanent deformation. All right. Now, coming to the fatigue parameter, now again just like rutting parameter various uh, studies uh, later after the SHRP proposed it uh, found that the value of G star dot sin delta since this is a stiffness based parameter is unable to quantify the actual fatigue cracking or the phenomena of fatigue cracking in the bitumen uh, that being more complex. So, several other tests were developed some of the popular test which became famous uh, where the time sweep test. So, in the time sweep test what you do now the argument here is that G star dot sin delta and G star by sin delta we are measuring under the linear viscoelastic regime is not it we are doing the test within the linear viscoelastic regime, but the actual binder may undergo or may be exposed to higher strain levels which may be in the non-linear viscoelastic regime of the binder. All right. So, therefore, uh, time sweep tests were developed and uh, how do we do the test? You select a strain amplitude, this strain amplitude can be out of the linear viscoelastic regime, you can do the test at different strain amplitudes. So, we will have a fixed strain amplitude let us say 6 percent or 8, 8 percent and we will see that how the viscoelastic parameter or the stiffness of binder or the phase angle of binder varies with time. All right. So, you see the variation for a very long period of time and then using the response you try to quantify the uh, fatigue resistance. The problem with this test though 
Studies have shown that time sweep tests give very good correlation with the actual occurrence of cracking in the field, but this is a time consuming test. Uh, it takes a lot of time to test a single binder at a single temperature, at a single strain level. Therefore, accelerated tests were further developed and one of the again popular test method is the LAS test or the linear amplitude sweep test, where what we do it is a two phase test. We do the frequency sweep test, so that we get the undamaged property of the material and we then do an amplitude sweep test, so that we damage the material and see the response of the material when it undergoes this damage. Now, this response which is measured in the DSR is further used in the viscoelastic continuum damage principle to derive the relationship between number of cycles to failure and the strain amplitude. So, the final equation which you get is in this form that n number of cycle to failure is equal to A into gamma to the power B. So, th this is the form and usually B is uh, negative. So, you can say minus B. So, which means that with increase in strain the number of cycles to failure will reduce. Now, this principle again since we will be not discussing about the derivation in detail, but it relies on the thermodynamics of irreversible process. I mean the base of use of this principle which states that the accumulation of damage in the material is basically related to the change in the uh, stored potential of the material with the change in damage which is occurring uh, to the power alpha. All right. So, uh, the negative sign says that uh, more is the damage less will be the stored potential in the material. So, this is negative in nature. So, uh, this is this principle is uh, used to finally, derive the relationship between number of cycles to failure and strain amplitude. All right. With this uh, we end here and just to do a recap that today we have talked about various tests which can be done using a DSR, various plots which can be made to understand the uh, rheological response of the bitumen. We talked about performance tests which are typically used to characterize the property of bitumen. We also discussed about the concept of uh, dissipated energy per unit cycle when you are doing a test on a bitumen sample in the DSR. And uh, we also uh, have talked about uh, various popular you can say test methods which are now being used to quantify the rutting and fatigue resistance of bitumen. So, in the next class we will start our discussion with the grading of bitumen and we will see uh, in, in reference to Indian specification typically uh, that how the grading system have evolved over a period of time and across the world what are the common uh, grading systems which are being followed and what are the requirements of those grading systems to select uh, or to characterize uh, bitumen to be used for paving applications. Thank you.